Okay. Okay, hello everybody. Welcome back to List NYC. I'm your host, Arthur Smiles. Um, so let's open the parentheses for tonight's speaker. Uh, tonight's speaker, Duncan McGregor, has had a polymath career, starting as a linguist for the 101st Airborne Division. He's also worked at NASA as well as was a developer for the Ubuntu operating system. Now he works as a principal software engineer at MediaMath. I had the pleasure of meeting Duncan in the YouTube comments section during Robert Verding's talk on list flavored Erlang um, when he talked about his music software. Uh, the audience um, pretty much absolutely demanded that I uh, get him on, and so I was happily to, to oblige that. Um, by the way, you can send your proposals for other speak, uh, speaks if you're interested in speaking at speak at listnyc.org. With that, I'd like to welcome Duncan McGregor. Hey, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. You guys can hear me okay? Yep. Great. Um, let me see. I go ahead. I've got a deck to share. Um, I'll do a window. Um, this is adapted from several decks that I've done on the same topic. And uh, it sort of aims to be a casual combination of the best of those. And in the same spirit as which you have the Lisp NYC meetings, feel free to jump in and, uh, and ask questions. I'm not going to watch the comments. I'm not super good about that, I'm tracking the slides. So if you want to speak up or if somebody else wants to watch the comments and share a question or not, totally cool with that. All right. Um, so the general plan is to cover these topics, but um, it's less a presentation and more a dialogue. So we may end up veering off at odd angles, and that's not a problem at all. Um, here are some superficial bullet points about me. Uh, and by the way, my first computer was a CPM K Pro 2 running on a Zillog 80 chip with the entire OS on a five and a quarter floppy, no hard drive. Um, and here's some musical background info on me. Uh, there's a new bullet list that I haven't added to this list yet. Um, just this semester, I started taking classes at the Berkeley School of Music online, gearing up for a series of courses and arranging and orchestral composition. So it's a quite, quite a fun development after uh, being away from music for so long and then coming back to it uh, a, a little over a year ago or, or so. Um, but how did I get into and how does this tie into generative music? Um, at OzCon uh, 2014, I met Andrew Sorensen. Uh, and he's pictured here after his uh, extempore live coding performance keynote. Um, and yeah, that's me, the one nearest to him with the short hair. Uh, Andrew and I talked about live coding, uh, and including my interest in using LFE and OTP along with Extempore. And he has actually spoken at uh, Lisp NYC, which is super cool. He's a great guy. Um, we chatted afterwards uh, after his talk, and um, he had mentioned previous conversations between himself and Joe Armstrong. So if you don't know Joe Armstrong, uh, was one of the co-creators of Erlang, along with Robert Verding, who's also here with us today. Um, and uh, we talked about possible collaboration. This is uh, Andrew and I. And I started using Extempore immediately. Uh, we sat down and had a coffee, and he shared his code with me, and I did a variation on it and published it, did a blog post, the whole nine yards. Um, life pulled me in other directions, though, so that was really the last that I had touched uh, uh, Extempore. But then last year, uh, after I saw this blog post, uh, which covered sound generation in Erlang, um, I ported it to LFE, and uh, I was sufficiently re-inspired to, to get back into uh, music generation. Um, but why? Why undertone? Uh, in a world with Super Collider, Overtone, Sonic Pi, why does there need to be yet, yet another? Um, and I didn't set out to build a new music system, and arguably this isn't really a new music system. Uh, rather, I just needed something that I could uh, use to accommodate my musical needs, which were 
strange um, and uh, uh, perhaps not ideally suited uh, to other systems. Um, but my needs did grow rather quickly. And, and I was asking a great deal of the systems that I was using and pulling together. I was, you know, open sound control and MIDI devices, external internal software, et cetera. Uh, I was running my own little music servers and whatnot. And I began seeing some pretty serious issues, including crashes at the OS level uh, for various services. And that's the point at which I was like, you know what, I'm done. No more crashing is allowed. Uh, let's get something running in a high fault tolerant, highly re uh, reliable way. And this is again just locally. It's not like I'm deploying this anywhere. Um, and so I wanted something that could that could restart automatically. Duncan, may yeah. I interrupt? Oh, of course. Could, could you describe what it is that you were building? Were you building a uh, uh, a controller for the sound, the various sounds? Yeah, I'll definitely cover that in a little bit, but I'll give you a little, a little prelude right now. And yes, um, I needed something. So I was doing a lot of guitar uh, and I wanted some ambient um, uh, synth music that was generated from uh, various synthesizer plugins, uh, a lot of uh, Moog uh, synthesizers that have been emulated in software and, and stuff like that. Um, and I wanted to be able to play randomly generated sequences in particular keys with particular types of chord progressions. Um, uh, again, as sort of an ambient backing, so I could do a lot of practicing with scales or actual compositions on the fly. Um, and in order to do in order to do this, I had to have a lot of different systems running um, simultaneously. Especially and honestly, really, I wanted to write. I wanted to write in a Lisp, to be honest. So I wanted my music to be in a Lisp, not in you know native MIDI and uh, you know not in something like Sibelius or anything like that. Um, so yes, though that's a little prelude, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, in, in a bit. Um, but because I was thinking, hey, this is probably going to be LFE, um, it's definitely going to be Erlang because it's of all of the languages I've programmed in, it is the one that provides the uh, most phenomenal coverage for fault tolerance uh, to get up up to speed uh, quickly uh, and running for fault tolerance and high availability. Um, so as a result of that, I said, hey, if it's, if it's going to be Erlang, let me do a review of what's happened in the Erlang world with regards to music. And it hasn't been much. And in fact, it was Joe Armstrong, the, uh, the, the first uh, uh, contributor and inventor of, uh, of Erlang, who did most of that early work exploring Erlang and music. And he did so in the mid 2000s, right up until his death just a few years ago. Um, and so I, I just reviewed everything that he had posted on mail lists. I looked at his example code. And as a result of that, one of the things that he demonstrated early on was open sound control support. And so as a result of that, that was the first thing that I tackled was how do I get open sound control working? And for those of you that don't know, open sound control is um, uh, sometimes considered a successor to MIDI, but it's honestly not really. Um, but it is uh, an open standard. That, that can be used for musical systems. Very often, it's used for digi digital audio workstations um, that uh, allows you to programmatically uh, control sliders and adjust plugins and that sort of thing. Um, these days, it's probably mostly used by touchpads, so like an, an iPad or whatever um, that connects to a digital audio workstation. All the faders that you see on there. You can actually connect with your iPad and, and, and move those faders as if you have a physical console in front of you. And that uses open sound control. That's probably the most common way you'd see it. But there's a lot of like, uh, there's an open source digital audio workstation, Ar Ardor, that allows you to control many, many aspects of it via an API using this protocol. So that's the first thing I did. Um, and uh, also uh, Super Collider uses open sound control. And so Super Collider was the first thing that I, uh, I, I chose to, to support in an LFE. And then I remembered, of course, I because I've worked with Super Collider before and it's been many years and I was like, oh God. Um, and not to say anything bad about Super Collider, uh, uh, absolutely, uh, but just my own perceptions. It just uh, is not the system for me. It's my brain doesn't fit like that. Maybe because I'm not a C coder at heart. Um, I think it's very it's a very comfortable place for people who uh, love uh, writing C code, um, but it doesn't feel that musical to me. Um, and then, of course, I remembered um, Andrew Sorensen from whatever it's been six, seven years ago, 
I was like, oh, of course, extempore. Why, why don't I just do that too? So the uh, open sound control support landed in undertone. Um, very nascent support for um, Super Collider landed. And, and then with those in place, I was like, all right, let's do a new backend for, uh, for undertone based on extempore. Um, so extempore runs at its own binary. And again, I'll get into that in a little bit, but it runs its own you know, binary on the operating system and data comes in and out of, of the airline system, LFE and undertone. Um, and it just took a few days. Within a few days, I had a backend for extempore and uh, I was in heaven. I was doing very musical things. I f it just feels like a very natural mix. And of course, extempore is Lisp. It's uh, written on uh, uh, tiny scheme um, in part. So, uh, so oh, that's- I have um, one request actually. Could you click the, um, the star camera so we can also see you speaking? Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. It's, it's a comment. It, it seems to happen. I wish you could do that by default, but anyways, I always forget until it's well in the speech. I'm looking for it right now. Oh, it's, there's a little, ah, there we go. Did that, yeah, that did it. Yeah, there you go. Okay, cool. I've been gesturing and pointing <laughs> and assisting the, the verbosity yeah. uh, with the, but uh, again, Don't worry, we imagined it. It, it. We imagined it much better than it probably actually was. <laughs> so it was. <laughs> uh, and I've lost one of my screens here. Gosh, where did it go? Sorry. There it is. Okay. So, um, Right, right, extempore. Um, and then in in my uh, in my search for a good good backend, uh, extempore, uh, you know, I got put that into place, and then I started to actually getting to use it and and wanting to push it further. And this is a little bit of what I touched on before. Um, my practice sessions with guitar and synthesizers, I wanted to be able to quickly write just a few lines of code um, for some ambient backing sounds um, initially and or chord progressions um, against which I could practice scales. Oh, and that's a Behringer, by the way. It's a, it's a, it's a desktop version of the, or the mini Moog. Um, you know, I wanted to practice scales, experiment with intervals and counterpoint, all this stuff, you know, with the assistance of, of, of programs that I could write in Lisp. Um, so, let's see, what did I, what did I do next? Um, Oh, visual feedback. I also wanted to do visual feedback. And this is something that has, uh, um, is a new feature. I think Robert, I don't think I've even shown this to you yet, but uh, can I switch tabs and will it show up? I think so. Yes, there we go. So um, this is a placeholder, obviously, a, a, a sharp major ninth, uh, no such thing, but uh, it's a placeholder and uh, for uh, the code is, so this is a, a web server is actually running in undertone. And uh, this, this is demonstrating a progression that's in the middle of happening. Uh, the DOM is updated via, via pushes right now, just long pulling, but it will eventually be WebSocket uh, based. But yeah, basically pop this up on the big screen TV in the living room, uh, let, the, let the progression run on undertone, and I can have random progressions in a particular key pop up and show me not only what chord is playing, what chord is gonna be next, but like the number of beats in this particular sequence and what beat it's currently on, so I can do uh, appropriate uh, preparation. And this is made for um, wonderful jamming sessions. And so the dream is slowly being realized um, as, as I walk through this uh, uh, adventure in undertone. So, so these are all the things that led to the why. And you know, here's some the bullet points of the summaries. Uh, it can be distilled into, into the next few slides here. I'll just skim past real quick, but I'll show these slides later too if you wanna go back and look at things. And if you want me to back up, just let me know and I'll, I'll, I'll back them up too. Um, and some more, more reasons why. And I'll talk about like the, what I, the TCP um, uh, servers and uh, the clients and whatnot. I'll jump into that a little bit when we talk about the architecture. And we're gonna see code too. We're gonna see Lisp code, so don't worry. Um, and then uh, a few more, few more reasons why. So this is how Undertone came about through that sort of convoluted, convoluted thinking process. Um, and now we can look at uh, uh, how, how it's built. Before I jump into the architecture and, and diagrams of that though, any questions so far? Any more questions? All right, here we go. Oh, oh go ahead, yeah. Oh, just one last, so what's, what's ETS? 
Oh, um, that is the Erlang term storage. Uh, it's uh, in, in memory a native uh, uh, database. Well, not not really database. Mesa is, is the native database for Erlang, but it's un, it's what underlies the, um, the the capacity for Erlang to store its data formats natively in memory and on disk, in fact. So yeah, it's a uh, very fast uh, local um, native storage for Erlang. Um, okay, so. Undertone is an idea and a set of needs. Um, and I'm saying it like that because I'm trying not to, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to sell it as it's this music system when in fact really Extempore does so much of the music and I don't want to give any less credit due to Extempore. It deserves so much credit. So the reason Undertone is an idea is because it's weaving all these things in, and that I needed together into one thing, open sound control, TCP clients and servers, UDP clients and servers. Um, the ability to, uh, um, to to send messages back and forth between uh, like actual running separate uh, processes, binaries on the same system, all through the same connection of of, of software. You know, so I'm not I'm not using IPC in one language and you know using gRPC in another, et cetera, et cetera. It's, no, it's all through one common framework. Um, a message passing framework for things that need to have messages sent back and forth between each other. So, in that sense, undertone is an idea. Um, Duncan, go ahead. So, so give this question for someone who doesn't understand music as, as much as you do. As a matter of fact, I'm a total neophyte when it comes to music, especially creating music. Why do you need to pass messages? Ah, so the the music itself uh, doesn't require that but all of the bits and pieces of the system that need to coordinate with each other do. So, and in fact, when you look at it, a TCP server is, is message passing. So the acts and the, and, the, and the actual data being sent, those, those are all essentially uh, messages being passed uh, via TCP. Um, it's, it's a loose, loose interpretation. Uh, but if you have a system, if you have a TCP server and you have, um, uh, uh, say like a, let's see, a TCP server, and you've got a process that is running, um, like an actual binary on your system that can receive data and can have data, it can send data out and that can be captured. Um, a system that is capable of doing, of communicating bo with both of those, a TCP server and something that's capable of capturing standard out and centered in within the same uh, controlling process, um, there's, you know, one of those things is Erlang. Erlang is a message passing uh, based language. Um, and it's a very natural fit for these types of systems to, to use that sort of approach. Um, so. Thank you. So like when it connects to the MIDI system, would MIDI events within undertone look like Erlang messages? They can. Um, I don't do native MIDI uh, processing. I use extemporary MIDI. Um, and the reason for that is because the quickest, so there are two, two approaches I thought about taking. Um, basically writing um, uh, um, uh, a NIF, uh, I forget that Robert can tell us what the abbreviation of NIF is, uh, but basically writing a wrapper in Erlang around the C code, um, which exposes some certain vulnerabilities, or I could write from scratch uh, an Erlang MIDI parser um, which of course, you know, that's serious yak shaving uh, rabbit hole territory. Um, and I wanted to make a lot quicker progress than that. Uh, I did honestly think about doing a wrapper around yeah. Port MIDI is a good open source uh, library that's been around for ages. Um, but the problem with that is when you write NIFs in Erlang and you're wrapping up uh, somebody's C code, you expose yourself to potential crashes. If your NIF crashes, the entire Erlang VM goes down. Um, and that was like from the start, one of the things that I wanted to avoid no matter what. I was tired of these bits and pieces coming down. I didn't want to pull something in that could t potentially bring down the system. And MIDI was one of the big issues I was having. Various devices, uh, you know, running out of memory and, you know, getting a bad message. And you know, there are all sorts of wacky things going on with, with the MIDI experiments I was doing. And it was one of the least stable parts of the system. So I didn't want to then bring a, 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 an, in, an unstable chunk of software into a part that was gonna crash the Erlang VM. So I opted for using MIDI that's used by Extempore. They also have port MIDI support. They have done a few patches over, uh, port MIDI's been around for a while. There's not a lot of recent uh, changes that have been made to it, 
they've made some recent changes to it for use in extempore. I can use the extempore binary very safely inside Erlang. No threat of crash in the VM. And so I went that way. I use their binary and I get port MIDI for free. So um, did I answer the question? That was a long rambler. Uh, yeah, yes, you did. So, but so, I mean, so, so extempore basically has all that MIDI you know, that you want to isolate yourself from. Absolutely. And so if it crashes, you just, your watch dog restarts it, blah, blah, blah. But when, when the extemporary communicates with the undertone system, does it look from within the Erlang part of undertone as if you, as if you did the NIF? No, it actually uses, and I'll get to it in a little bit, but I'm totally cool with answering this now. It uses something called ports uh, in Erlang, and this is basically Erlang's um, FFP. Yeah. So, um, and it's great. It's, you know, for a message passing system, it makes sense. You define a binary message, send it back and forth and tell, you know, whatever system you want to consume that, this is what you need to do to parse this binary. Okay. Um, very, very simple message. Okay. Thanks. So, yep, that's what it does. It uses ports. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Okay. So this is a classic diagram. You will often see the style of diagram in, uh, in various, um, I'm, not, I'm not even sure if it's that popular anymore, but it used to be popular to do at an airline talk to have a, docu uh, a diagram like this. Um, so that's a nod to history, but uh, this is probably a little bit more familiar to some folks. Um, and uh, this is really sort of the big picture uh, of the, the system context. And let's, um, let's, let me walk through this as if we were making music right now so you can understand how, it, how data messages, uh, command and control flow through the entire system. If you can see this clearly, if not, I will, um, I'll just call out the colors. Okay, so obviously you know who the user is, the little blue thingy over there. Um, and let's let's imagine that the interface for this person is a REPL. It's a REPL that you are typing, uh, let's say, 90% extemporary dialect of scheme. Um, this, uh, let me zoom here because it's actually, oh, here, I've got glasses. Um, so in the REPL, you are typing um, scheme forms. It gets sent, uh, it's processed and parsed by uh, Undertone itself. And then Undertone is taking, depending on what you typed, it might uh, short circuit and capture some of the input for specialized commands. But if it doesn't pass any of the matches against specialized commands, it just assumes it's 100% extempore uh, scheme. And it packs it up as a bit string and sends it over the wire via TCP um, to, uh, to extempore itself. Um, extemporary then takes that chunk of code and it says, hey, you know, it does the regular parsing, it does the compilation on the fly very, very fast. Um, and then it does the appropriate um, processing out to either DSP or, or, or OS and audio uh, and MIDI, OS MIDI. Um, and it just has all these possibilities that can happen inside extemporary, very full um, microcosm of, of music in itself. Okay, so once extempore sends out the appropriate uh, data as either MIDI or audio, that goes to the system and, uh, and then can be processed by you know, devices that are connected to your computer. So like, like I've got here a, a mini Moog sitting here on my desk or a synthesizer in the living room or, or, or a DAW you know, that's, that's gonna be processing MIDI um, software, um, software synthesizers. Okay, so that's all from extempore. Now you can also type commands in this in undertone as well that if you're using open sound control um, that don't go to extempore at all but but go uh, off to, to your DAW if that's what you have uh, your open sound control connected to is your DAW and you're moving faders on your DAW. Sorry, digital audio workstation. It's like the thing that looks like a console in a, in a control booth for, for sound or, or a studio, audio studio. Um, you can also like write your own open sound control server that could even be like a MIDI bridge to something else. I mean, there's so many things you could do inside Undertone, just all these services running and each of those has its own output into these, any, any of these other directions. And lastly, of course, there's this gray chunk down at the bottom that is Erlang itself. And this is Erlang OTP. Um, 
this is the whole bundle, the suite of, of libraries and capabilities, features that come with Erlang itself that allow so many of these things, including, as you can see, you might be able to see, I've got a note there about supervision trees. Um, and this is how Undertone and all these little bits and pieces, eh, um, the bits and pieces in a dotted, in the dotted purple line, which we'll get to in a little bit, the pieces in there are all popped into a supervision tree so that if any one of them dies, various strategies are, are followed and either um, restarted or a, a connection is reattempted with exponential back off. Again, depending on which component uh, may have experienced the failure, there's a whole set of strategies, there are a whole set of strategies that, take, that can take place as a result of this. All of that rests on the gray box of Erlang and its supervision trees and various um, um, uh, Erlang slash OTP uh, servers and whatnot. So that is music, the person types it in the command and depending on whether they're in a REPL or whether they're, whether they're in the, an extempore REPL that, that Undertone has provided or whether they're in a native LFE REPL, because you can interact with extempore via the native LFE REPL. There are various, there's supports for various capabilities there. Uh, for instance, you can control, like if you have a software synthesizer or even a physical synthesizer that allows you to send control codes to it, you can actually tweak knobs like a, 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 on a Moog, classic Moog, all those knobs, you know, cut off and frequency and whatnot. You can use uh, the LFE, native LFE, to send signals as if you're tweaking all those knobs and changing the sounds of your, and there's a demo I've got, I'm not gonna show you today, but I've got one on, on YouTube that goes through that. And actually, you can tweak the knobs with LFE and you hear the changes to the synthesizer. So again, all depending whether you're using whatever you're doing there as that little blue person, um, sending these signals through undertone, it may go to extempore, it may go directly to a DAW, it may, maybe you're doing something with Erlang itself, which I'll show you an example of in a bit, or or you're passing through Erlang, uh, sorry, extempore into your, into your audio or MIDI devices externally. So that's music moving through the entire system and it should start to give you a sense of it. Um, and let's- That's really cool. Bring back my notes. Oh dear, what did you do? There we go, okay. Sorry, things are flying around here. And I did lose something here. I lost my slide deck. There you are. <laughs> so many screens. Okay, so that's the music process. And um, little, little bullet points here to, to sort of underscore some of these things. Um, and like I mentioned before, uh, Undertone does spawn the extempore binary. It's a managed process. Oh God, I just got a message that Outlook is updating office hardware or software. Sorry, so I don't know if anything's going to get messed up here. Okay. Um, ba -bum -bum -bum, yeah, so we, we still we still see everything fine on, on, on the screen. Excellent. That's good news. <laughs> Okay, so, and all of these things do go into a supervision tree, like I mentioned before, and I will be talking about that shortly. Um, where are we now? Okay. So, oh yeah, in addition to extemporary support, there is some early support for um, a, a backend that was created by the head of engineering at Moog. So uh, there is a man named Geert Bevan, and he has created a couple of CLI utilities for MIDI that are phenomenal elegantly done classic unix style utility does one thing does it incredibly well he handles standard in and out beautifully standard error beautifully um, it's sort of a dream to write against uh, in the in the wild woolly world of of people doing midi utilities this guy did it right and if you see any of the the moog uh, apps that are available on, on the app store for ipads and whatnot this is the guy behind those two and you'll get it really brilliant uh, software engineer. So he, and we've communicated a, a bit about this um, and uh, it's fantastic. I've got a, a, um, a very experimental backend early stages using his two command line utilities, one for uh, reading uh, MIDI and one sending MIDI and one for receiving MIDI. Um, and that looks a little bit different. Um, so uh, let's see back up. Yeah, that's his, that's his right there. Um, and, and I'll show you some other uh, diagrams that show you how the processes run a little bit differently and the various functions that are running, the long running uh, processes are, uh, in, inside Erlang are for that and how they're managed. But, um, but yeah, so there's, it's a, there is support, like I said, there's also support for Super Collider. I haven't used it in over a year um, or almost a year. 
Um, but people can if they want to submit PRs and, and add stuff to it. It's there. It's ready. It can it can take uh, um, new features and whatnot. And it's just a new back end that runs. Okay, so back the extemporary back. If we zoom in on the one section in the purple, um, this one right here, we can see a little bit more of how Undertone pulls um, systems together. And now we're going to dive a little bit more. I'll show you, show you some code. Um, this particular view of the architecture shows um, which LFE and OTP components are connected to, to each other and how. Um, and it might make sense for me to quickly talk about system startup, um, just to give you a, a sort of visceral feel of, of things that are running. So when, when Undertone starts up, it's, it's packaged, you can, I'm gonna say it and then you can forget it, but it's packaged as what's called an OTP release. And so there's a whole chunk of things that, that come with this, including scripts for being able to start this as if it was a standalone binary, um, lots of great stuff. Um, but it also brings up a whole series of dependencies uh, in the order that ne needed in order to bring up the system. So, so what happens is uh, there are a whole set of, of things that Undertone does depend upon. And when you start Undertone, it utilizes the underlying uh, Erlang OTP infrastructure to bring up all these required uh, bits and pieces first. And so if you're watching the log files as this comes up and you have it, have it set to either info or debug, you can see a lot of details on what component is coming up and when. Um, some of it is asynchronous and some of it actually goes into a blocking mode uh, to make sure that, that a necessary bit is up and running before the next bit, which depend, depends upon, is up and running. Um, so all of that's happening. And uh, one of the components is the actual REPL server. And the, if you're running Extempore with, so Extempore doesn't come with its own REPL. Uh, you can use Emacs with it. Uh, but I have written a REPL for it uh, in LFE that you can type native uh, extempore inside. So that brings up a REPL, but it, the REPL also has some history tracking. So there's some storage, uh, memory-based storage, uh, and that's where we talked about the ETS a little bit ago. So there's some ephemeral uh, sto storage there um, for uh, commands that you typed and being able to reference those and rerun those easily. Um, there's this whole suite of configuration um, that's pulled from either the command line or, um, or config files. Um, that's actually its own, a little bit of its own component there. A TCP client um, that uh, connects to Extempore, because Extempore uh, offers a TCP-based um, uh, compiler as a service, basically, via TCP. You send it bit strings, it compiles them, and either sends you results or just processes things in its own state. Um, and this is a, uh, there's a smart bit happening here where it attempts to do a connection right away as soon as the system comes up. Uh, Extempore does not offer any sort of, uh, other than just accepting a connection, it, it offers no other capability for something to determine whether it's ready for, um, uh, uh, whether, whether it's ready to start processing commands or not. And so what happens is this TCP client comes up and it says, okay, uh, try to connect, couldn't connect. I'm going to back off for like two seconds, try to connect, you know, the typical ex exponential back off. And then as soon as it does do a full successful connection, uh, gets some data from that, parses the data, make sure everything's great. Then it says, okay, hey, rest of the system, you're ready to start processing commands to and from extempore. And then a whole suite of other things ru start running as well. Um, uh, there's an OSC client that, uh, that you can run if you can enable that if you want as well. And so there's all these little bits and pieces. And as the system comes up, each one of these things in its own time is, is happening. Um, and, and slowly starting up. And once it's all up and running, all these things can then communicate with each other as designed. Um, and if one of them starts to experience a failure, you'll see some of the strategies that Erlang uh, employs uh, kick in and, and do restarts of its own. So, and in fact, that uh, the restarting TCP client underneath the hood, uh, deep inside its internals, it uses some of those own, uh, some of those same strategies for its own management of connections. Um, but those aren't exposed. Those strategies in the TCP client are not exposed inside LFE. Uh, sorry, sorry, uh, uh, Undertone. Undertone has its own sets of strategies that do, it does expose that you can then tweak and change according to your own needs. Um, okay, so that's like how the system starts and all the bits and pieces talking to each other coming up. Um, let's go back here. <clears throat> um, 
let's do a little bit of code here right right now. So I'm going to stop sharing this and go to Emacs. Um, I think. Uh, yeah. All right. Emacs, where are you? I've got an Emacs here with big font, so you should be able to see it. I think that's it right there. Yeah. Okay. So I ran a command on the command line before this started, and it's just the default way to create a, a basic application uh, for LFE, a skeleton project. Um, and that is the presentation. Here is my Emacs. Okay. So let me go there now. I thought this might, no, sorry. Okay. Here we go. Yeah. So this. Hey, Duncan. Yeah. Will you tell us what we're looking at? Right here, what you are looking at is what is a file that was created when I ran a command line utility that said create a skeleton project for me that is um, a straight up vanilla LF, uh, yeah, LFE Erlang OTP application. What this, what this means is it's going to create something called an application uh, that is the entry point uh, for this whole suite of things to get started. And this application is going to have another module. Uh, this one right here, soup. It's the supervisor. So it's gonna it's gonna then start a supervisor. Um, so the entry point, you come in anytime, and this goes for any sort of uh, OTP application you're creating. You have an application as your entry point. The app then says, oops, sorry, I pointed the wrong one. It's a stop. Here's the start. Um, go ahead. I'm I'm here. I'm alive. My application high level stuff is all set up. The system knows who I am. It knows what I'm named go ahead and start my supervision tree. And so then it will uh, load up a module, I think this one right here. Yep, it'll then load up whatever you've defined in that one it, we just have defined and appointed here, the soup um, the supervisor uh, module. And it says, okay, go ahead and run the start link um, function in that module. And that's this right here. And so this is what kicks off uh, the, the supervision tree. So uh, Duncan, it, would, would it be possible to uh, just increase the font size a little bit? Oh, sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, I thought that was large. Let me make it even bigger. I can um, see it fine, but some of the people can't. Uh, let me do uh, 36. Might get some wrapping, but hey, that's OK. All right, how's that? Is that good for folks? Um, I mean, it's fine for me. If anyone else has it, you can let me know, but. It's excellent. Okay, so uh, this, uh, and again, to, to sort of recap, so we, we have our app and that's the entry point. The app then, once it brings itself up and it gives its name to the system, which Erlang is tracking behind the scenes, it says, hey, there's an application, I know its name. Um, and that application, the Erlang system has a whole suite of API uh, function calls that you can make that interact with the app itself at that level. The next level down is the supervisor. Um, and this is where the supervision tree gets started up. And this right here, this one example, it has um, one child. Um, and that's right here. So the init function is, is ultimately called right here. Um, and there's a, uh, just a utility private function here defining the child. And this is all more or less bo boilerplate convention, really. Um, uh, but it's well-defined convention. It's actually above and beyond convention. It really is. There is a way to do this correctly in Erlang. It's documented. So um, I'm creating a single child here. In Undertone, this part of the process has multiple children defined. And depending on the back end, it might have more or less children processes defined. So these, these children are uh, linked processes, which means that um, you can track uh, um, the, it, it, uh, you can track the, you can do monitoring on it. You do have to enable some monitoring stuff, but you, you can uh, include it in the strategies for, stop, uh, for, for restarting. Uh, it, when you link a process, you, you have uh, much more control over it, uh, and you can, um, you can engage all of, the, all of the strategies of restarting and, and, and managing and whatnot, the processes. And in, in Erlang and LFE, the processes are actual functions. So it's not, it's not an OS process. It's not like a green thread. It's a, it's a function in Erlang with, um, uh, with a message box. And it can receive messages and, 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 uh, and send messages and whatnot. OK. So, um, so this is what it looks like uh, at the supervision level. 
And to to add more more fuel to the fire here, uh, like I said, an undertone, you can have other children here. Well, you can have additional supervision trees. So you can nest your supervision trees as much as you want and have whole branches that control uh, suites of, of strategies for how you want your different parts of the application to uh, um, to behave under under different failure conditions, and this, of course, is uh, as you might imagine, critical for uh, for systems of systems. So, if you're building a very large system that has lots of complex behaviors that you want to isolate in different supervision trees, this is a great way to do it. Uh, and the, this is o OTP Open Telecom platform. This was originally done for you know telephone switches, and so again, you can imagine the high level, the high demand for reliability that is needed in that industry and why you would have features like this in the language. And, and, and going back, actually, can you just get, give a little brief uh, explanation of what a supervision tree is? Absolutely, we're gonna talk about it a little bit, but yeah, okay. it's, and I'll show you visuals for it too, so it'll be yeah. a nice, you'll really have a nice intuitive sense for it. But, but basically, um, it's a graph of, of managed, of linked uh, processes, linked Erlang processes that say, hey, I, um, I know about this process, it's been linked to me, I can communicate with it, I can stop it, start it, rest kill it, um, and I can set strategies up such that if any part of my supervision tree, or me myself, the supervision tree, uh, fails, then uh, you know maybe my strategy is restart everything, maybe it's just restart this one thing, maybe it's like, you know what, bail, this thing was critical, if it fails, the whole thing should just be brought down, you know, just a total, full and complete crash. Um, so there's all sorts of strategies you can employ uh, for this. And the supervision tree is what helps you manage those over time um, and manage those relationships. So you're managing the behaviors of them over time as well as how they're related. Um, and you can dynamically add stuff. You don't have to sort of uh, uh, define all of your structure of your tree ahead of time. You can. There was a demo I did years ago um, that started up, I don't know, like 10,000 child processes um, dynamically and added them as necessary. And there's like a whole heat map thing that it, it drew for you um, when they were under load and whatnot. But but yeah, so you have just a vast amount of capabilities. Oh, um, Robert did a demo, uh, same same conference, same OzCon 2014 uh, that Andrew Sorensen was giving his keynote. Robert did a did a demo with like VoltDB and uh, and I think it was Luero. Um, so Erlang uh, running a, a Lua dialect that did, um, I don't know, a huge, a huge number of like rocket ships or something. I forget exactly, but you know, thousands and thousands, maybe ten thousand uh, uh, different processes that are running, all managed in a supervision tree. So yeah, the possibilities are endless. It is a graph. It is a graph of linked processes, and along with that graph, that relationship come uh, uh, very explicit sets of instructions like restart permanent. Um, you, you see right here, shut down. You know, um, uh, two seconds whether it's a worker or another supervision tree. So there's all these sort of things that you can attach to those linked processes and say, this is what it needs to do under these various circumstances. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, it's intense stuff. <laughs> it takes a long time to get to know it. Once you do, oh, I can't tell you the number of times I've used other languages in production environments, like uh, pulling my hair out. Why don't they have OTP? This would be so much easier. Um, <laughs> Kubernetes, people lean really, really heavily on Kubernetes right now yeah. at, the, at the virtualization, you know, faux metal. Um, Erlang lets you do all that stuff at the programmatic level, which is wonderful. I prefer to do it there, honestly. Um, okay, so, and then lastly, there's one last module here that is the lo lowest level, the child. So what is this child? It's making a reference here to my LFE app, start link. Well, there is a module, my LFE app. It's a bat, it's a generated name based on, you know, just whatever, so it's, um, ignore the name, but this is the lowest level. This is where the actual work is taking place. And this is where you'll see me make, make reference to this top level application. Second one we just looked at a minute ago was the supervisor. And the supervisor had one child and this child right here is a gen server. And it's just a, what it says, it's a generic server. Uh, and it, you can ex, uh, it can accept inputs. Uh, it has an API for accessing it. Um, so these, are, for example, I, these are custom functions that I added to this particular module. So anybody that can import this module, um, uh, sorry, load load this module, will have these two public functions available to it for as as part of the API. You know, it's just a dumb API. Echo back a message and just share what the PID is for the particular function, the server itself. Um, and of course, you can do extremely complicated stuff, you know, full HTTP servers written in this way. 
Um, but yeah, so that's the that's the common stack when you build an OTP app is you've got you know an application, you've got at least one supervisor, and you have at least one you know long running function or server in this particular case um, that is is you know processing requests as they come in. It handles state behind the scenes for you, and it passes state. It's, it's functional programming language. There's, there's no global state. So each of these, as a message comes in and it handles it, it goes ahead and passes itself back up to the, it does a loop behind the scenes and says, okay, the state has either been updated or not, but here's the new state, you know, go ahead and pop this in and uh, for the next iteration. Um, very, very elegant uh, uh, approach to uh, managing highly complicated um, long-running processes so okay so that's that's a quick look at code oh hey you know and while we're here um, you might see these funny little forms here what, what's going on um, so uh, this is pattern matching so LFE because it comes from Erlang has pattern matching just like you see in Haskell um, um, and I think Prolog too actually um, but uh, yeah, so there's pattern matching against inputs, and these are atoms. So it's pattern matching against uh, a stop command. Um, it's pattern matching against a tuple that has uh, an echo atom plus some variable that it's assigned to message. Uh, and then just a pass through right here for anything. Hey, well, I don't know what this command is, it's not supported. Um, and so these are all of Arity 3. So this is a single function with three function heads match against three different types of patterns, all of them of the same arity. And, um, and the nice thing about, uh, one of the nice things that I enjoy about Erlang is that it does support multiple arity. So handle call is actually part of a defined, uh, you, you implement this uh, for a particular set of behaviors. But uh, for instance, our own functions that we, I could have a uh, echo that took two, two arguments and they would both be called echo I'll echo slash one for one arg, uh, one arity, and then echo slash two for two args, two arity. Um, so, and there's no conflict there, of course, because it does separate, LFE uh, does separate these, uh, these in, into their own sort of um, uh, variable space, as it were. So that's, and that's why you'll see things like in the LFE marketing, uh, it's a list two plus, uh, and that's the plus, is that extra arity uh, separation you get. So you can have the same function name with different arities, and you're you're totally okay with that. But yeah, so there's a little example set of examples here of some pattern matching that you get when you when you use uh, LFE. Um, so the whole point of this, while it's up in front of you, was to show you what a skeleton project looks like for uh, a serious application in LFE, application supervisor and a gen server in this particular case. All right, let's go back to the deck. And Undertone is built using these same principles, um, just more complicated. Um, so I need to stop sharing, I think. Yep. Move the little guy. Stop the share. And reshare my slides, which are here, I believe. OK, yeah, so back to the architecture diagram. Also, make sure you press the uh, camera so we can see you. Video, thank you. Yeah, because every time you share, uh, when you fr freshly share your screen, you have to actually um, electively hit the camera. It, it's, it keeps lagging, so. Yeah, give it a second. Um, there we go. There we go. Awesome. All right. So let's get back to my presentation here. Um, okay, so that's some code OTP, LFE OTP. Um, and then one last note on this is everything that you see in that uh, dashed purple line, with the exception of extempore and its little blue box, all that other stuff has been written in LFE proper. So there's, there's a fair amount of LFE code that has gone into sort of weaving all these bits and pieces together and making them reliable, making them so that if one piece fails, everything keeps running and that thing that failed is restarted. Um, okay, so and here's a quick summary of the architecture. We'll skip over this right now. And then here's the progress check. Yes, we've done these three things. Okay, and this is what I promised earlier. We're going to take a little bit closer look at supervision trees. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, this is of special importance to Undertone. 
uh, because honestly, it's one of the main reasons uh, I built it in the first place. I wanted to have reliable, uh, real-time music processing happening where if something failed, I was able to keep playing uh, and I was able to keep hearing the music come through. Um, and it's kind of amazing, actually. Uh, you can have um, whole chunks of the system fail, uh, even extemporary itself. Like I've uh, hit a couple of issues where I loaded some old libraries from extemporary that were no longer supported or hadn't been checked in a while and were kind of buggy and uh, crashed extemporary itself. And it came back up. And I did have to enter state uh, and, and update extemporary state side to, to be able to uh, be up and running again, but everything was there. All of the data was there. I didn't lose any data. Uh, all the song works work that I had done on the fly. Nothing was lost and huge sigh of relief because <laughs> this was after months of banging my head against the wall after pushing things too hard and having lost everything. Okay, so um, special importance, supervision trees. And we did look at some code, but here's a, here's a little bit more. Um, and so that init function that I showed you in the um, in the supervision tree, this is, uh, was, I think it might have gone, grown a little bit since I just captured this, but let's just say is um, the init function for undertone supervision, supervision tree. And there's some conditional stuff happening in here. Um, it's checking to see if the back end is extempore or a bevin. Um, and it does a different set of children. The extempore back end. Uh, is running not only the gen server that's managing the state and handling specialized commands, it's also writing, running up its own REPL, uh, ex the extemporary REPL um, that, it, that, I, that I wrote for, for uh, extemporary in LFE. Uh, the Bevan backend doesn't have its own language. It's just a set of command line utilities, so it doesn't need a REPL. We can just use the LFE REPL as is to, to enter all those commands. So, uh, so that's what's happening here, and that's why it's a little bit more, more complex. Every single um, no matter what backend you are, what you have configured for Undertone to run, there is still a main server, a main Undertone server that needs to run no matter what. And that's that first one. Um, it's that first child that started, and that's why that's separate and it does, it does not have a conditional that's required. So, so yeah, that's, um, and then here's the visuals I was promising. So in this particular case, uh, this is the uh, extemporary backend. And as you can see there, the, this is, um, I think Graph is, uh, actually I don't know what it uses, uh, what Erlang uses to generate these, but it's like Graph is uh, regardless. And this was done live. Uh, I brought up an observer and I said, show me what the graph looks like for this running application. And you can see there's the undertone.server. That is the, um, the default server that every uh, backend will need to have running no matter what. And this is extemporary, so it's got its own state management, and then it has the REPL uh, process. And these are all processes. They're in the supervision tree under the undertone.soup supervisor. And then there's also, um, uh, so I told you a little bit about this before. I'm going to mention it in a little bit as well. But or you see me with the blue, the Earl exec. So this is a library uh, that I'm using to, uh, to, to uh, basically manage external processes. So binaries that need to run, I need to run them as a long running process. Um, I can do that without this library and I was doing that without that. I was just using Erlang ports. But when you do that, you don't, it, Erlang ports, you're, you're, it's very low level. You're just starting up uh, an app, uh, an application of binary and you're able to send to and from standard out, uh, standard error. You don't, uh, you don't have management capabilities there. So you, there's no tracking, hey, what was the PID of this, the OS level PID of this process? Um, who's the user? Who's the group? Uh, you know, can I, can, I, can I restart it? You know, I, I, I know it's still running. Oh, hey, you know, if something went wrong in the system, it's still running, can we, can we stop it and restart it? You don't have any of that. However, if you switch from using in the just low level ports in Erlang, to the Earl exec library, it still uses ports under the hood, but you get all this extra management API on top of it. And I needed this because I went, again, another situation where I was having months of pain. I was having these processes that were running, I'd stop the system and there would still be an executable running on the OS that wasn't managed. And so before I started up Undertone again, I had to go find that process, kill it. I got tired of that. I said, you know what? I'm just gonna throw it into a, a supervision tree and, um, and manage that process. So Earl exec, the library itself, comes with its own supervision tree. And when I say, hey, library, 
please manage this process for me, it stuffs it into its own supervision tree. Mm -hmm. And and then I can do all this, you know, hey, you know what? This really does need to be shut down. I'm actually closing the entire application. Please go ahead and, and exit gracefully. Mm -hmm. There's a delay as it's sending all these messages back and forth and checking that everything's safe and secure and it does a proper shutdown. Um, and no orphaned uh, OS processes right in the background. Okay, so that's extempore. And then like I had mentioned before, there is the Bevan backend. And that's this right here is the Bevan backend. It does not have a REPL like I mentioned before. Uh, but unlike, so if you go back and forth between the two, unlike the extempore, there are two uh, processes being managed in the URL exec. And so I'll hop back over to extempore. You can see there's just one here. The URL exec is managing the extempore, bi uh, the extempore binary by itself. And this right here, no extempore. This is the Bevan backend, but it has two CLI libraries, like I mentioned before, MIDI send and MIDI receive. And so it runs those. And you can actually pass messages back and forth between those two, um, those two command line utilities using um, URL exec and Erlang ports. Um, but it does need to manage both of those if you want to be able to both send and receive MIDI. Um, so that's the two structures, two very different supervision tree structures, one for Earl exec and one for undertone. Again, um, uh, based on the type of, all done via configuration. You tell it what backend you want, it does this stuff automatically. All right. Clients and servers, lots of stuff here. I think probably most people have are bored to death with this sort of thing. A thousand examples of it. Um, you can do beautiful, quick uh, TCP servers and clients, UDP servers and clients in and, and Erlang. If you have any questions about this, we can pause, but I'll just go ahead and zip right through these. Um, yeah, I've already mentioned all this stuff, in fact. So um, sound control, uh, again, I haven't talked too much about this, but I've, I've referenced each of these bullet points already. Um, holler if you, wanna, uh, if you want me to stop. Um, more stuff there. Okay. Uh, a couple libraries are mentioned there. That's fine. Mm -hmm. um, okay. More clients and servers. Gen servers. I mentioned that uh, before. That's only one. That's the generic server uh, that offers. But there's all sorts. There's Gen Event. Uh, you can do an event-based uh, server. It's track state. Uh, gen state M. That's a state machine. It's the new state machine in OTP. Um, and in fact, the TCP library that I'm using is. Uh, is an LFE, a complete LFE rewrite of an older um, um, community uh, contributed uh, Erlang uh, TCP library. Uh, it supports back off. Uh, but what I did there is instead of using the old uh, gen server based, I, I tried using a uh, state machine. Uh, and it's a little bit cumbersome uh, just because state machines can be a little bit tricky, uh, hard to debug, but there is a really nice mapping of TCP connection management and state machines. Um, so that uses, it doesn't use gen server, that TCP library that I, that I rewrote doesn't use gen server, it actually uses gen state M as its underlying um, uh, long running process. So that's just more client server stuff. What else we got here? Okay, so, and this is what I was telling you before. So Erlang's solution to language interop is, is quite elegant, no FFIs. There's, there's an interface library, but yeah, we can set it aside for now. Um, and it, it uses a uh, message passing. So it defines a simple binary protocol and the data in the protocol can be set to standard in of a running process. And, um, and, I've done, and I've done this, I've done all sorts of examples. I've got a common Lisp server, Go server, Python server, Rust server. Basically all they do, it's, it's the same thing that you see in, in, uh, in Kubernetes deployments or Docker images that you just have a, a, a daemon that writes to and reads from standard in, standard out. Do the same thing here um, in in Erlang in the Erlang world, and you can read uh, you can read and write to standard in and out, and it's just going to capture those the the binary messages, uh, do whatever parsing that you set up, um, and uh, and off off you go. So there are libraries in Common Lisp, Go, Python, for um, processing Erlang um, uh, uh, ports format. And that's that's what I've done there. So, and the same same sort of approach is here. As I mentioned, the Earl exec library that I'm using now, uh, it does that under the hood. So I'm no longer manually doing all the port management, and it's confusing the terminology here. Ports, it's um, uh, it's the the means of of communicating between uh, the, pro the various processes uh, started on the OS. All right. 
Um, and then, yeah, so I, I did have to, like I mentioned, I did have to switch to using Earl exec and this allows me all the management capabilities. Um, and, uh, yeah. Okay. So there's a bunch of slides here on dependencies. Uh, don't, we're just going to skip right past them. Um, bum, bum, bum. and this is what we've covered so far. We have looked at the languages a little bit, but let me just do a quick little uh, scan. This is a classic uh, recursive function in Erlang and LFE, and you can see the pattern matching that I mentioned before. Um, simple classic pattern matching example here. Um, the positional mat matching uh, that's happening, the pass through at the end that's matching, um, and the two different uh, syntax differences uh, between Erlang and LFE. Um, okay, so the, we've already looked at supervisors, so I'm going to skip past this too, but there is um, sort of a, a more or less classic opening chunk of a module for a supervisor uh, in Erlang, same exact thing in LFE. Um, all right, so extempore itself, uh, you would have seen this during uh, Andrew's talk. Um, there are two flavors of, of uh, extempore scheme. One's called xtlang, and this is essentially is what provides low-level asset, asset access to all aspects of the extempore system. It's uh, essentially a thin scheme layer over extempore's low-level C code, and you can see that there in some of the references to the types. Um, you can do some really crazy things that Andrew's demonstrated, mm. changing the actual um, code running on the metal. Um, so you can redefine how the system itself behaves. He really opens things up, no fear. <laughs> he lets you do anything you want to to the running system um, in extempore. It's, it's kind of amazing. And then there is what most performers use, and that's um, just straight up uh, extempore's higher level uh, derivative of tiny scheme. And this is what you'll see me use uh, in the demos and whatnot. Uh, okay. And as I mentioned before, this is the REPL, uh, the custom REPL that was built for, uh, for extempore in, in LFE as part of Undertone. And um, I, I actually frequently switch between using it and Emacs. This is, if I need to copy and paste a chunk of, a big chunk of code, I find it much easier just to use the LFE REPL. Um, sorry, sorry, the extempore REPL written in LFE. <laughs> Um, and then for individual things, I often will just uh, do the control C, uh, control C in, um, in Emacs that sends a, a bit string from there into the, the extempore compiler. Okay. Because um, extempore itself, as I mentioned before, doesn't have a REPL of its own. So once you start up the REPL, you have uh, access to a help function, and this is modeled after LFE's own help function. Uh, and these are all, there's a series of special commands uh, that are offered inside the extempore REPL, and these are what those are. And I had mentioned this earlier too. And then the remaining set of, anything that doesn't match these special commands is just passed through and, and assumes you've typed an appropriately um, formatted uh, correct syntax uh, extempore uh, scheme, and it passes it on to the compiler server. If there is an error, it'll, it'll get logged to the output in undertone. You can do your um, debugging like that. Okay, um, session management, so this is like, uh, if you have, you know, typed a bunch of commands, you can say, hey, go back and uh, the command I entered is now index five, rerun that. Or, hey, you know what? I want you to run five, four, and three uh, again, all over again. Go ahead and do those. Um, so this offers that, that sort of convenience that I have used extensively um, when uh, doing all sorts of experiments and stuff with music. Okay. And lastly, a fun little bit here. Um, the, you know, the REPL is never going to die. Uh, and here we have the, you know, straight out of um, P Peter L. Deutsch, uh, his creation from the, er, er, uh, I think it was early 60s when he did that. Um, uh, the only reason it's not using eval itself is because you can't, in LFE, you can't shadow eval. So it would be LFE's eval. So I have my own eval for, uh, for um, uh, undertone, and it's just using, you know, uh, a literal print eval read uh, loop. So it couldn't get any more straightforward than this. Classics. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So and that's right in the source code itself. That's a lovely bit of, of pedagogy. Okay, so um, demos. Okay, 
we did a lot of trial and error with the audio and um, teleconferencing hasn't quite caught up to what we would like to see for audio hi-fi. Uh, it's getting there, but it's not quite. So you could very well hear glitches, bleeps, bloops of the sort that we would not like to hear. So not the, not, it's not being generated by a Moog uh, synthesizer. It's, it's an artifact of teleconferencing software. Um, so there is going to be some of that, I'm sure. Uh, and I apologize in advance. Uh, that you means... don't need to apologize. It, it, it's <laughs> me because it's not, it, I'm the one who's hosting. But uh, yeah, we did we did test some things out, and I think we'll get a good idea of at least that it plays music. But just realize that some of the um, noisier elements are not his software. It's completely blamed on uh, what we're doing. Uh, you know, hosting this thing, uh, using all open source, by the way. So we're going to get there. We're going to get there. So um, Jitsi, hopefully Jitsi will catch up eventually. I, yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would suggest we all uh, mute our microphones to increase our enhancement of the music listening experience. Um, awesome. That would be great. Um, and I'm going to have to, like, do you know, sound switching at my end, so it'll be a little bit awkward, but it's okay. We'll, we'll get there. Um, so with all that being said, I do, I'm very, very particular about the synthesizers that I use, the quality of samples that I get, v like really, I do all sorts of research and listening. I'm a big fan of Eric, Eric Whitaker. Um, there's a great sampled choir for him and I'm actually going to be demonstrating some of that for you. Uh, but if, if it's a little too weird for you, if you wanted to hear the high fidelity, there are some links here and I can, sh I can show those links afterwards as well, um, to, uh, to high fidelity uh, thing, um, segments that have been pushed up on SoundCloud. So you can listen to them in their uh, mostly uh, pure form. They're not FLAC, it is, it is MP3, so there will be some compression, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's good, good quality. Um, okay, so there is, and in fact, the, the SoundCloud there for the piano piece is a Ravenscroft uh, nine foot ground, but actually what you're gonna be hearing in today's is, um, is based off of uh, German Steinways. So much darker sound, which is appropriate for like Chopin. Uh, it's, it's quite beautiful for Chopin's work. Um, so that's what I'm using. Same company though, a beautiful, they do a beautiful job on sampling pianos, one of my favorites. Um, okay, so I think that, now there's gonna be two demos. Well, maybe just one, it's up to you. If you would like me to do the second demo, which is a little bit longer, we're running a little bit long right now. Um, maybe we can, maybe we can have some drinks and I can do it or whatever, but the first one should be very high quality. It's pre-recorded um, and it's classic uh, Moog, uh, Moog work using software synthesizers. Uh, so you shouldn't hear many, if any artifacts there. Um, so that'll be the first one. And then we can talk about yeah. it. Before we start, I actually got a, I, I actually got a question from uh, YouTube. Paul McGee asked, what OS do you use prefer? Yeah, so um, it used to be, Linux and Mac, I've gone so deep into uh, audio and digital signal processing and digital audio workstations that I'm pretty firmly in Mac land now for, for all of my music. And the, the hardware support is phenomenal. The, uh, the digital audio workstation support is phenomenal. I use uh, PreSonus Studio One. There is an open source DAW that runs on Linux as well as Mac. It's called Ardour, I mentioned it before. It uses open sound control. So a lot of great stuff you can do for controlling the faders and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, there's uh, the, the, the plugins, the VST plugins that I use that allow me to use MIDI to control sampled audio. Very often they will only work on Windows or Mac. Um, very few of them support um, uh, Linux across the board. Um, but Linux is getting there. Uh, I hope to get, a, I, I had my favorite laptop ever. It was a ThinkPad, I wanna get another one. Uh, so I'm still gonna keep pushing the, the, the Linux stuff as, as far as I can. Um, and Undertown itself should run just fine on, on Linux. There's nothing I'm doing that is uh, uh, Mac specific from, from that end. The DAW, of course, is. Okay, so any other questions before we do the first demo? I think we're good. All right, so let's try this out. I don't think I have to stop sharing. I can go ahead and share the video, YouTube video, right? Share YouTube. I think so, yeah. We'll do another try. Three, the, yeah, the more actions and then share YouTube video and then people We'll all be able to watch it. Okay, cool. Um, oh, it needs the URL. Uh, maybe that's still the same one. Sorry, hang on. Back up. Cancel. Let me grab that. Grab the URL from.
first thing I'm going to do in the demo is paste all the code into the custom extempore REPL. And we can look at our session, see all the commands that we've pasted in order indexed for easy reference. Now I'm going to start up the sequence progression. And initially it's just the sound effects channels playing. And I'm going to slowly bring up the background pads. With the accompanying tracks is coming up in volume now. Sort of a space organ sound. And what you're hearing is the chord transitions being played, as you can see in the terminal window. And this is the Markov chain in action. So for every chord that's currently being played, when it's time to switch, it looks at the available legal ones that it can transition to, and then it selects one. How long, how loud, these are all determined um, in our function, our progression function. Easily changeable, both in real time and, um, and ahead of time. And now we're going to bring up the sequencer tracks. The sequencer is defined here. This is also possible to do in pure LFE. We're doing everything in extempore right now. And that's where the progression actually starts the sequencer. And the sequencer is selecting its chords and notes depending upon the current progression is being played. And we can see in the plugin the notes actually being played. Again, all of this coming from the LFE REPL, or rather, LFE running the extempore REPL. sound here on the Berlin School. And now we've just transitioned back from major into the minor key. All the progressions played so far. be done in uh, with LFE code, the tweaking that we're doing right now with the knobs. There's another demo that shows exactly how to do that. Just changing the frequency of the filter. You'll hear a few glitches here and there. Um, I had some problems with overloaded plugins and uh, buffers, so if you can forgive that, I'd appreciate it. Bring the frequency back down.
did we lose our speaker? Up, oh, yeah. No, yeah, there he is. Okay, he's back. I got some uh, comments about that. for a bit. Sorry, sorry about that. I, I got yeah, that's okay. Um, I got some comments. Um, Justin J gave you a big red heart, and Tom Smalls thought it was very cool. <laughs> I don't hear anything. I think I might have to. And yeah, Raul just mentioned after forever. Nice. Hmm. We're getting a lot of them, a lot of uh, positive comments. I don't hear anybody else. Oh, you don't? Um, do you hear me? I'm gonna try to reconnect. Yeah, try, yeah, just yeah, go refresh the browser. Use the link that I gave you. Um, so yeah, we'll get the, um, continue us now. Okay. He's going to refresh. Um, yeah, that was really cool. Um, I think, well, can, can you hear us? We can hear you fine, but I don't know if you can hear us. Oh, Okay, good, 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 great, okay. <clears throat> so that was um, a fairly straightforward, fairly simple uh, set of, oh yeah, I don't know if I have control over that. So I can hear everybody. Um, can you, wait, wait, can you, if you can't hear me. But that was a fairly, fairly straightforward i mean there's a lot of code you saw there i was just trying to control lots of different things at lots of different times but when you really come down to it, the music of it, it was extremely simple and if you were listening to the, the the changes and the transitions you could tell that it was very straightforward um but one fun thing um is that the sequencer you saw the code for the sequencer there what that was really emulating was uh the sequencer in uh, in the classic Moogs. So in, in, in those, there's like a panel on that. You saw the, the visual representation of that Moog synthesizer. Well, there's a panel on those Moogs that is about eight wide, three rows across um, that can all be linked. So you can either, if you have, you know, eight notes, uh, 16 notes or 24 notes in a row being played in your particular sequence. But what's super cool is that those sequencers originally were um, actually from telecoms equipment. The first uh, sequencers used uh, for these various synthesizers, and even before Moog, were pulled from uh, telecoms uh, racks and used to <laughs> to generate music note sequences. And so there's a beautiful full circle bit of synchronicity here where LFE, written on top of um, uh, an OTP, a telecom platform, is being emulated, uh, is being used to emulate old telephone sequencers that were used to make note note sequences so yeah it's kind of a fun bit of of a, of a history twist there um our host is he around i'm here but uh, um you can't we should hear you guys we are <laughs> i'm watching the chat right now though, so click the microphone I don't know what you mean by to select your speaker. Um, but you can still hear me though, right? Oh, but maybe I can't hear you. You mean, is that what you're saying? Ah, gotcha. We did have this problem before. Um, it looks like it's set correctly there. Try one more spot. Set correct. 
be there too. Yeah, darn. Um, well, let me try and reconnect again because that is what happened before is that I had to reconnect. Um, I tried it this time and it didn't work, but maybe it will again. I don't know. I'm hearing sound effects coming through, like the sound effects from, from Jitsi. I'm hearing those, uh, the disconnects from, from the people. Okay, anyway, let me try. Hmm. That's weird. Check. Okay. What about everyone else? Can everyone else hear each other? Does anyone else want to say something? Yeah, I can hear fun. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I hear. I hear you both talking. No worries. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Uh, I I have one question. Uh, how would it be possible to do the same setup uh, with Ableton Live and and Max for Live? Evil. Um, let's see if you can hear us. Can you hear us now? I don't know if you can hear us. No. Hmm. Uh. One second. Uh, no, not like that. Yeah, I'm still not hearing anything. Darn. Yeah, sure. Let me mute this. Okay, guys. Um, I should be able to communicate with him out of band, so uh, we'll see if we can figure out what's going on here. Okay. Um, There's some telecom heritage. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so um, if you click on the audio settings, the yellow up arrow, you can select the speaker and the microphone. So the microphone seems to be working, but I'm, I'm wondering if the speaker is set up to something other than what you're listening to. All right. Hold on a second. Sorry. I forgot to put you on uh, speaker. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've switched back and forth a couple of times. Um, oh, that's weird. The, uh, yeah. Um, maybe we could try the. Uh, I don't understand what's going on here. Um, uh, it seemed to happen after you you stopped sharing the YouTube video. Could you check the more actions and see if it says stop sharing? Maybe that's what's screwing it up. No, it says. It just gives the option to share it. But here, let me try oh. this. I'm going to actually uh, turn off my audio unit. Okay. Um, and let the system refine it, see if that brings it back on. Meanwhile, uh... So let me let me ask uh, people this on the chat. Can you can you hear Duncan speaking right now through my mic through my microphone? No. I, I heard him before. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. So you guys can hear me through the microphone, and I can hear you now. I think. Great. I'm I'm gonna hang up here just to double check it. Up oh, there you go. Okay, we're back. So somebody so somebody say something. Um, can you hear us? Test, test. Hey, can you hear me? There we go. Hey. 
I, I can barely hear Arthur now. Is is he audible, perfectly audible I'm to here. other people? I'm here. I'm here. I don't hear him. I, I hear Arthur. Yeah, I hear Arthur. Okay. Anyways, if you have if you have some sound problems, you can just refresh um, on your oh, end. Oh, yeah, that's, unfortunately, that's not something I can control with, with Erlang or LFE, but yeah, I know, I know. It's a great demonstration of the fallibility <laughs> so, of audio devices and systems. You create a Jitsi uh, no uh, actually restart a physical audio device in order to get sound back. And uh, yeah, I ran into all sorts of wacky issues like that. And all of them, all the ones that were controlled by Extempore and, uh, and now controlled by uh, LFE and, and Undertone have gone away. I have not, since I did that months and months and months ago, almost a year now, have I had any of those particular sets of issues, which has been phenomenal after endless months of issues. So it's high reliability is a wonderful thing. <laughs> I can hear you great, but your lips are out of sync. Jitsi uses um, Erlang in any way, like on the um, you know on the back end. Who else does? I, I, I wonder if Jitsi does. Um, oh. uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I do not know. Robert might might know. Um, uh, uses Erlang how? Robert for the um, Lambda Days functional programming conference. That's what we use was Jitsi. Hmm. I don't know. I. Just, I I don't know who, sorry, I can't help you there. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've used it. Uh, I know that high volume, the companies that do high volume, real time bidding type stuff, uh, very often will use Erlang. Um, in fact, I know companies that stopped using the JVM because of uh, issues with garbage, garbage collection, the, the, uh, yeah. the lockups that happen or have happened. Uh, I, I can, uh, yeah, I've, I've done that real time bidding uh, using JVMs and uh, yeah, uh, GC pauses were a big problem. We actually had to not use the latest version of Java because they do, didn't support a fast enough garbage. The older garbage collectors were faster uh, than yeah. the new ones. There was so much money being lost as a result of this that it was it was actually less expensive to have everybody learn Erlang, bring in an Erlang expert, do a full rewrite of Java into Erlang, um, you know, which took like six months and and have everybody bring that system up and run and get it running. It was cheaper to do that than to, which, you know, it's a, it's a large team than to persist with the garbage. Do, do you know which company that was or can you, can you tell us? I do know and I can't say publicly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But doesn't Azul system sell JVM that doesn't have problems? Yeah, okay. Can you hear me? I see your mouth moving, but I can't hear you. That's a pink one, sorry. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yeah. Can you? Yeah, I can hear. I just noticed, speaking of your lips being out of sync, I just noticed that Lisp NYC is an anagram for lip sync. <laughs> <laughs> It's the law of conservation of lip sync. We have lip sync. <laughs> well, you know that uh, we have it in other places. We are uh, planning this a very long time ago. This is why we're, we're way ahead of our time. We, we planned the name specifically for this meetup to finally get that joke out. It was a, it was a 20 year thing, right? <laughs> and of course, you know, we're not, we're not happy. The only way we're happy is that, is that, is that hack the situation in order for it to, for someone to spontaneously say it. So. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there are other JVMs that have those like improvements, but then they're not as well supported and they don't work necessarily as well, um, on yep. forms and things like that. So you, you sort of sometimes lose the benefit of, uh, you know, of using Java if, if you're, uh, yeah. if you end up using yeah. those custom JVMs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. When, when I was at uh, Deutsche Bank, we yeah, used, uh, using Erlang, uh, Rust, Go solving in different, different ways. Yeah. yeah. You can type your comment, Ogi. Am I pronouncing your name right? Ogi or Ogi? Yeah. Ogi, yeah, it's perfect. Perfect. Is there a, there a problem in my uh, microphone? So, I mean, you could try uh, 
Well, I, I'm not sure what's going on, really. I think the can you can well, you hear me? Well? I can hear you fine. Yeah, okay. so can I. You probably are heard on the on the uh, on the thing, but uh, yeah, just ask your question on the chat and um, just type it in the chat. And I'll ask it. At this particular instance, my Okay. I mean, it might be what like what just happened with me and Arthur, where everyone it seems could hear Arthur except me. And then I reconnected, and that problem was fixed for whatever reason. Interesting. Then maybe I should reconnect again too. Is this about him? Oh, hey. Yes. Oh, there he is. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Now let me just. It's better. Yes. Perfect. Yeah, he can hear you now. Uh, you hear okay. Yeah, I'm not on Chrome. I'm on Firefox. Uh, I, I think <laughs> I, I have. A, I have three microphones connected, and like also very much into music. I use Ableton Live, yeah, uh, produce music, like play with uh, Max for Live also as well. I DJed also in big parties. Uh, but it, this was very, very impressive. I want to ask you, I, I saw that you're using uh, Studio One. Uh, would it, is there any advantage? Over using something like like Ableton Live or no, no, is Ableton there any part Ableton Live is great, and in fact, if I did more sampling, um, yeah, which I thought about doing, um, you know, like found sounds that sort of thing, I would almost certainly get a license for Ableton Live. It has incredible yeah. support for digital signal processing and. Um, yeah. I used, uh, honestly, Studio One. I, I'd been out of the game. I did music recording uh, when it was all analog. So in the, okay. just as, as digital was coming in with like those Alesis units and whatnot. So that was mid 90s, yeah. Yeah. early 90s. Um, I was doing a little bit of music then and then I got out of it shortly after that started. Okay. Uh, and so then when I got back into it a few years ago, a friend recommended, you know, I was looking, I was thinking about getting um, Ableton, oh, Avid. I was thinking about getting Avid uh, Pro, uh, Pro Tools. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he said, you know what, try Pre Sonus, you might like it. And it's been brilliant. It's been super easy to use. Uh, it's got a great uh, fan base. Um, yeah. Uh, and I'll use yeah. it until I need something else. Yeah, I, 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 I also tried, I also tried uh, producing music on, on Linux. Mm -hmm. um, I found, what's the name, Reaper works really well on Linux. Uh, but the problem is like still number of VST plugins don't don't really work well on, on Linux. Yeah, very limited. That's too bad. Yeah, I've noticed yeah. the same thing. And I'm quite I'm quite addicted to my high 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 quality sample VST plugins. Um, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. There's a there's one there's a drum uh, drum set uh, that I'm saving up for. I uh, would like to get for doing some prog rock stuff. And it's just got, it was sampled uh, in, I think, Belgium at a, a studio there. It's okay. at um, surround sound 11.1. They put, they have depth. Oh, wow. Yeah, high, it's incredible. But uh, I listened to some of the samples from that. It's just amazing. Yeah, yeah addicted to hi fi uh, sampled quality yeah. music. Yeah. So Arthur's asking about live. I do have a live demo, but I've uh, uh, this, this talk went quite long because we we sort of shot from the hip. Um, but I don't want to take up too much of people's time, um, and we've been starting to have some audio issues, so I'm, I might give that a pass. Um, but I can. Oh, you know what I can do is uh, so the 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 demo that I have for you, I can actually do. Let me let me share um, share a screen. Um, Remember, I remember to put my video in my fresh air. Okay, so window, Max, and back here, share, and video. Um, okay, so the demo is top somewhere here. Um, Okay, 
same way the faucets are going to be in this way. Oh, that's the function of the library. There we go. There's a demo. Okay. So this demo was taken from, so I did this demo once at, um, for uh, some friends that I know in Glasgow. I did a, uh, uh, their CodeCraft, I did a talk for them there. And that was based on Andrew Sorensen's talk that he gave at Code Mania 2015. In fact, that should actually be a capital M. Um, and this was a, a, a delight. Okay, so what Andrew did is he did a programmer's guide to Western music. Um, and tongue in cheek, he used um, Black Adder as the as sort of the framework for it. And so he did series one Black Adder, you know, um, music and Western music, you know, from ninth, ninth century to, you know, pre-Renaissance. You know, series two uh, was maybe a little bit of Renaissance and some, and some Baroque. Uh, series three, I think uh, that covered the Romantic period, so like some Beethoven or whatnot. And uh, series four, I think I don't know if they're. I think he sort of started to go off of his, his uh, adder, um, black adder uh, paradigm at that point. But he did um, some of the atonal uh, expression work, and um, and then he took it all the way up into the 70s uh, with some uh, experimental music. I think uh, Robert Reich. Um, anyway, the the demo that I did. Uh, so he used when Andrew Sorensen did his talk. He used the native synthesizers that come bundled as part of um, Extempore. And what I did is I, and his code was old, so that was 2015, and Extempore has changed a great deal since then, 2021. And what I did is I updated, there was no code for it out there. I had to look at his YouTube video and see the code that he was sharing, uh, uh, write it down, and then change it for 2021 version of Extempore. And I also then started to convert it over to MIDI as well. And then we were chatting on the mail list, and there's so, so many layers here. And they were talking about, well, we should really redo that talk using the new feature of Extempore called Patterns. And so I actually started doing that for this talk. And so uh, un unlike the talk almost identical, or the demo almost identical I did for Glasgow, um, here I did it uh, using Patterns. Um, and I've implemented part of Patterns in native LFE uh, as well as uh, in, uh, in just using Extempore's Patterns. And this is the, the macro that they use for the actual play. And then I think there's a stop macro down here. Yeah, there it is, that's the stop macro. But you define, uh, the, basically this whole thing happens inside of this pattern macro. Um, you name it so that you can reference it later. Um, you give it like the number of notes uh, that, that you want it to play. Um, and then you can define uh, any sort of expression inside here. And then you have access to various uh, various uh, variables in, inside there. And uh, the first, um, uh, you, you can then pass, uh, it's n arity, so you can pass as many sequences as you want into that. And you can those can be interpreted as notes, as volume changes, as whatever. And you can reference those with at one, at two, at three, you know, in the sequence of what you pass them in. But there's this great macro here for, uh, for uh, and Sorry, I'll finish my sentence for creating music. And um, I didn't port all of this demo. Uh, so if we scroll down to, uh, there's the Black Adder reference. So uh, Black Adder circa 1000 AD. Uh, and this is plain, plain chant example here. But um, if you scroll down further into the stuff where I didn't get a port, if you're not using patterns, then what you do is sort of old school. That's more patterns. And here we go. No, that's still patterns. Here we go. Nope, model two is pattern. I take it back. Model 2 is not patterns. If you're not using patterns, then you're going to be doing callbacks. And most of the demos that I've given, and in fact, the one you listened to a minute ago was done using callbacks. Um, and it's fairly straightforward, uh, you know, asynchronous temporal programming is what Andrew calls it. Um, you just say, okay, uh, here's my metronome. Uh, let's go ahead, my, given my particular beat uh, and the duration that I'm going to play, go ahead and and run this next chunk, this next iteration, this next recursion uh, at this point in time. Um, so that's how you do it sort of classic extempore. And there's new support for what I was showing you a second ago with using patterns. Um, anyway, the point of me showing you all this is that there is code here. You can totally, I'll give you a link to the code. I've got this published on GitHub. If you watch Andrew Sorensen's uh, video from 2015, there is no source code available for it, but you can come back to this source and you can actually run these examples yourselves uh, with whatever 
uh, with, a, with whatever MIDI devices you might have at hand. Um, and you shouldn't be able to, you should, you should be able to look at his code and actually run the native devices uh, without any trouble at all. Uh, only might, maybe even, maybe no changes at all um, using the on the built-in synthesizers that Extemporary comes with. But it's a great talk, uh, and I can't do full service to, to the delivery that Andrew has. He's a phenomenal speaker, and uh, it's just a brilliant talk. Um, and one of the things I would love to see, I would actually love to see him do part two of this, where he really dives in deeply. Give him two hours, you know. Give him a day. Let's make it a workshop, you know. Let, let him dive in. Because uh, one of the things that I started doing for this was for, I'll scroll past the, the live, um, sorry, the, the sound checks and get to that series one of Black Adder. Um, right, so this is a, a slight reworking of his example. I couldn't duplicate his example exactly using patterns, but I came pretty close. But then I was like, hey, you know what? The, the Monty Python gag is great from uh, Holy Grail. What about that? Um, you know, the, and so I found out what that was. Uh, Deus Esu, Domine, Donaeus, Requiem. Um, and then I looked at like various transcriptions and listened to the thing. Well, it was a real gag because a part of the gag was they were just singing the same notes over and over again with like one tiny inflection change at the end, and more than inflection, an actual note change at the end. So I did some research on this and found out what the real piece was. And of course, this is anybody that knows about old music uh, and um, pre-Renaissance music in, in Western uh, in the Western tradition. This is what's called plain chant, and the song itself. Uh, you can find medieval notation for it, and there's a YouTube video that I share here where you can actually look at the at the original, uh, I'm pretty sure it's original, uh, notation that they'd, they'd have, uh, that the monks would have used for four line stays. Um, and then I did find a reference under gregorianbooks.com of uh, a 1954 publication where they converted those um, medieval notation uh, for the pieces into modern notation. And so then on the P page 94 of that particular PDF um, and page 78, as it's listed, as it's shown at the top of the page, you can find that melody here. And this is the pattern uh, melody. Um, basically, uh, these notes are played as is, giving the timing that you tell it to initially. And then if you group anything, um, like in threes, this creates an automatic triplet. So it, the, the timing that A, G, F, et cetera, are played this whole uh, series of notes, E, D, and back to E, will be played using that same timing as, as an individual note. So you know, quarter, 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 eighth triplet. Um, anyway, so so yeah, this fun little process of going through and looking at, okay, Blackadder, funny, great. It, he does a great job of, of showing some examples, and I duplicate those examples, so you can listen to those too. But then to dive in a little bit more, and you know, obviously Monty Python's still kind of silly and funny, but then the reality of it, finding out what, where did they get that from? What was the actual source of the music? And then, um, so here there's the melody, and then uh, it plays the melody as is written in that, uh, in, the, in the chant book, um, uh, gregorianbooks.com. But then I did a quick little analysis uh, what, with the actual transitions. Uh, these are the MIDI notes, uh, the actual, sorry, um, the MIDI numbers associated with these particular notes. So these are the MIDI pitches. And so I converted those and the transitions. So I, what is the transition? Is it going up by how many? Um, and so I marked all those down and then, um, and then wrote a little function that does exactly that. Well, uh, this has changed since then. But anyway, um, uh, the, this is a little function that is almost like that. And it basically generates a, a statistical, sort of brain dead statistical similarity. Um, but you can take it one step further, and instead of just doing averages, you can, um, the next model here that I show as an example down here, is a Markov chain, and I mentioned that in the other demo. So here's a Markov chain of, of that same piece. Um, the notes of different uh, transitions moving to other transition, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, a transition from one note to the next, and then from that second note to a third. That's what this measures. So this this checks what those what those total sum of legal transitions are for duplicating the sound of that original donai. Uh, oh, sorry, PASU uh, should be PASU or TASU. Um, PASU um, that piece. So this is a Markov a set of Markov transitions for that piece. And then um, here's uh, a function that that helps generate. Uh, um, um, a string of, and, and I think I can give the length, 
Capability starting, yes, uh, starting transition, starting now. Capability. I thought I could, <laughs> I've lost track of what I did. I thought you could say how many notes to put in that. Um, anyway, the, this melody does is generated using those markout chains. And so then what you have is this choir sound that is in the same key um, and uses the same sets of transitions and could very well have been from that particular book. Um, it is uh, it uses all the same exact transitions. So anyway, um, there's so many audio problems going on right now. I'm going to give it a pass, but I have the source code and that and I'll provide the link for that video. It's a phenomenal video by Andrew. I highly encourage everyone to go check it out and I will stop sharing my screen now. So, uh, I actually have a question from YouTube. Um, Paul McGee asked, what was the... Because I'm not hearing anything anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can hear. Oh, hey, yes. I can hear you. Okay, good. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, I think that pretty much wraps it up. Um, I, I, do have, I do have some questions from YouTube. And bring it back uh, Duncan, are you hearing uh, Arthur? Because he's trying to uh, relay a question from YouTube. I am not hearing Arthur, but if he can type it or somebody can <laughs> Well, or go to YouTube and look up the question, which he's asking questions from YouTube. Have you checked Arthur's uh, little box on the on your screen and checked maybe you you've like clicked the mute button or adjusted his volume because you can do that per person, right? That's a great question. Let me search for him. I'll, I'll just we could, I'll just relog in, or we could just repeat what he said, otherwise known as playing telephone. <laughs> I, uh, I'm back. Hey, I can hear you, Arthur. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, um, yeah, so the question was, is uh, so Paul McGee asked, uh, what was the UI made with? The UI, oh, the, um, the, I, I the think you might mean the UI in the demo. Actually, um, just to answer, because actually uh, Robert Verding, so there was a little UI in one of the slides that showed the series of processes. And Robert Verding mentioned that that was made with WX widgets um, in the comments. And then I think, uh, I guess for the main demo, uh, maybe you can explain that. Sure. So, and that's a little bit of what was asked by um, Augie was um, uh, the the one where you saw all the, the sliders, that was my DAW. So that the console with all the sliders and the, the spectrum, uh, that's like a pro um, EQ. Uh, that was my DAW. That was pre soundness of the company, and Studio One is the product. Ableton Live is another one that we talked about. Um, Avid uh, Tools makes one. And then there's an open source one called Ardor. And um, I have found it to be extremely competent. Uh, I've used it for a bunch of things uh, months and months ago. Haven't used it in a while. I pay for the Mac version of it, so I contribute back to that product because um, they provide binaries. And uh, But you can build it from source if you want. Um, and so you can do very similar things for free without having to uh, shell out the cash for um, for a digital audio workstation. But that's what that is. Um, what else? What else? What else? Uh, oh, the the thing where you saw the Moog, the the modular Moog. So if you know Emerson Lake and Paul Ring, if you've ever seen um, um, uh, Keith Emerson up on stage, either on video or in conference, uh, <laughs> conference uh, in a concert. Um, you could see how big these Moog, uh, those Moog modulars were uh, in reality, are in reality. You can still actually get them. Uh, huge. And so what you saw there was obviously a tiny little version, a virtualized version, uh, but they modeled it. They actually did digital circuitry modeling, sorry, um, yeah, digital modeling of analog circuitry to generate all those sounds uh, very, very much like the originals. Uh, and you can get exact sounds like that Yes did, that, you know, um, uh, Rick Wakeman did, that uh, Emerson Lake and Palmer did, all those all those greats from the 70s. Oh, and in fact, uh, Tangerine Dream, that's like my go-to is uh, Klaus Schultz uh, and Tangerine Dream for that, that 
perfect uh, electronica sound of the 70s um, done with those sorts of, of machines. So that was their user interface that you saw a little bit of keyboard and the knobs. That was a plug-in uh, that you can buy and run via MIDI on any system that so maybe Mac and only maybe only Mac and Windows for that, but any system that that plugin supports, um, you can run it in various DAWs. I think the open source DAW will also play that um, that VST plugin on the Mac. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Then you saw the terminal, of course. Uh, you saw the logging window. I think that was it. Yep. And then Robert mentioned the other uh, the the nodes that you saw for the processes that were running, being generated by Erlang's observer application use underline using WX widgets. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, I mean, I ha actually have this comment that I, I, I've been saving up, but uh, I, I, I was um, really impressed with um, uh, the, the choices of your technologies. Um, Extempore, Extempore is an excellent uh, program for music, but also I think that, that what you're, showing it as a lot more application than just music, like having, um, using Erlang as not only as a communication fabric, but also as a process um, control. Yeah. I think it's a really powerful combination. I know yeah. there's other applications that like other libraries that are like, uh, you know, like zero MQ that, yeah. that are focused on communication. But I think this is the first time I've really seen the uh, utility of actually having both because um, a lot of the times there's these different programs that do these different things. But, you know, like the bad thing is like, you know, if you use like C groups and Linux, it's not really um, scriptable. Yeah, yeah. Right. Exactly. And here you can do everything uh, using using the uh, command line. Yeah. Um, it's very impressive. On that note, I have a great story. I wish I could. I think that I think the Twitter account is gone. Um, but there was somebody I used to chat with on Twitter about PDP 11s, 8s, 10s, the whole nine yards. I'm a huge fan. I, I run those. There's the project. Um, there's actually several projects. But for for running like CTS, uh, the, um, the time sharing uh, um, operating system on virtualized PDPs and all that. Anyway, I uh, had a great Twitter conversation with somebody years ago where they and this may be the reason they were <laughs> their account was deleted but they um had old deck equipment they could no longer get replacements for so i, th I think it was pdp tens i kind of think it was pdp tens could no longer get replacement parts for the various uh, components and he worked uh, for a power company um i want to say it was a nuclear power plant <laughs> so absolutely critical stuff so what they ended up doing was uh was running uh the pdps in virtualized um in virtualized hardware and so they had the actual operating systems running the the nuclear power plant management software was running and they couldn't um uh obviously couldn't let it fail and so their solution was to stuff all these virtualized pdp 11 machines inside an airline supervision tree and then the Erlang uh, system uh, ran the whole the whole tree on their uh, whatever beefy beefy hardware they had running all this stuff. You don't need a lot, obviously, for the PDPs. It doesn't take much. Um, but they had a big old system so that it would be secure and safe and had all sorts, all sorts of backups. But yeah, they had. <laughs> and I, I want to say nuclear power. It might not have been. It might not might have been a regular power plant. Um, but yeah, it was all running in, uh, <laughs> in a supervision tree using Erlang to to keep it up. Nine nines. <laughs> Amazing. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Yeah, I was curious, what do you think of the idea of like, it seems like music being inherently concurrent, mapping Erlang processes into onto actual musical before, instruments. Before I go, let me get you that link for, um, I'll pat, paste it in the chat, that link for, uh, uh, and if somebody can paste it into YouTube, that'd be great. Um, okay, yeah, I'll do Andrew that. Sorensen's lovely, lovely talk. Um, it's so much fun. I've watched that. I've probably watched it six or seven times by now, and I've studied it three times, just over and over again, watching what he did. What um, was the title again of it? The link real quick. Andrew Sorensen. Here we go. YouTube. Pause. <coughs> Share. Copy. Okay, here we go. Yeah, that's his, uh, that's his talk. Um, it's just a delight. Oh, and uh, head to, the real talk starts at the three minute mark. 
So I probably should have moved the little time parameter to, th to three. But yeah, really a, a good watch, especially if you like extempore. And extempore is brilliant. It really is brilliant. Um, and that's one of the things that Robert was asking at the talks that we've done earlier this year. You know, he's like, this is incredible that we're not, we're like, you know, Erlang is not sold as C fast. It's, it's, it doesn't excel at C level, um, low level hardware, you know, it's, it's not your compute thing. It's your message passing thing. It's incredibly fast networking. Um, how, how is everything playing on time? And it's really kind of amazing that you can do real time music uh, processing with extempore running as, as managed by Erlang and you're not missing any beats. Um, you know, nothing's being dropped. It's really phenomenal. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so Extempore is a great piece of engineering and it's just lovely yeah. to have it integrated into uh, an OTP uh, application. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I'd also like to mention that we did have uh, Robert um, explain LFA, the, like pretty much the primer, right? But what I re really enjoyed is actually, you know, seeing a real like example other than like instead of example code, but like, hey, look, this is how I used it and why I used it. And I think, you know, having having uh, you, we're combining all the great things, right? We're com we're combining we're combining uh, everything that was developed in the '80s with L with um, Erlang, having LFE, right? So we can do it all in Lisp, right? right? And get all the advantages of that from the '50s. Say, uh, <laughs> it's a real, <laughs> but I think I think I can. Um, I, if I can underscore, if I can underscore undertone, is that this is really a great lesson because I think a lot of people are out dealing with these same kinds of problems. Like how do okay, like you said, mentioned Kubernetes before, right? Well, this this is an even better way to 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 do this coordination. If undertones like the you know, the orchestration of all the of all these systems, yeah. then you know doing the same thing and having the having having it all in in a repo. Yeah. Basically, yeah. Um, yeah. I think it. I think uh, more people uh, need to look at this uh, as a uh, secret weapon to their projects. Totally. And hey, on that on that note too, uh, interesting set of comments came up in mm -hmm. discussions. We brainstormed a little bit one of the conferences about this. People are like, okay, well, you've used a distributed Lisp. Where's the distributed part? You just on a single system. And I was like, yeah. So envision this, right? You have three people on a stage together, each running their own instance of LFE. So what I didn't show is that in LFE, you can actually bring up, um, uh, uh, if you're from the same network and you're all sharing the right appropriate cookies and whatnot, airline cookies, not browser cookies, um, you, bring up, you can each bring up nodes on, on the same network. Uh, you can talk to each, each process. And as long as you've been granted permissions, you can execute code on, on somebody else's machine or somebody else's node really is what it is. It's, it's, it's another node. Um, and uh, there's like a sort of little mini DNS server that Erlang ran, runs that, that, that allows all these things to communi communicate. That's not actually DNS. Um, but right, three performers up on stage, each of them playing, uh, using LFE to play their sequences. You could actually have a separate process running, you know, or probably written in LFE, that then shares what each person is playing, tracks it, observes the, the statistical patterns, builds an appropriate Markov model for each person's play, and then can be integrated into the other person's, um, whatever Markov chains they have running, um, their performance. And they can have uh, notes begin to automatically in integrate. Like for this particular transition, uh, LFE is actually going to play this because these other two performers did something similar and these patterns will match really well. So you can imagine, and this is, we're not even talking AI yet. We're just doing straight up dead simple Markov chains based on transitions that other performers are doing. But the thing is, it's so fast and the messages going back and forth are, are so performant and extempore itself is so performant that you would have the ability to basically on the fly as a distributed Lisp, be able to uh, live code and then integrate what your partners are playing on stage live and have your own stuff be augmented based on their play. And which is just unbelievable. And of course, you know, the, the creative person can say, hey, you know, in the real world, I could do this and this and this with that sort of capability. So, so yeah, there's all sorts of amazing stuff you can do with this sort of thing. So um, anyone else? Wait, wait, wait. I just want to make one quick comment talking about, about the speed of, of the virtual machines, about the Allang systems. Sure. Um, 
if you go if you go to the latest one, twenty four, which is coming now, that that in many ways is significantly faster than the older ones. They made some really cool changes internally to get it going much faster. Uh, we're not up to we're not up to sea level yet, but um, it's def- oh, it's significantly faster that. than the old ones. Oh, is somebody talking right now? That I can't um, yeah, that was uh, Robert Verding mentioning that um, that there's a newer version of Erlang that's coming out that's um, um, significantly faster than 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 the uh, the version now. <laughs> right, it's a just in time compilation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And LFE is going to hit two point soon too, so there's going to yeah. be. LFE 2.0 plus the faster airline. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's, yeah. it's an amazing world. Oh, and there's the machine learning stuff that's happening in Elixir that is yeah. being done in such a way that it's not just usable by Elixir, but it's usable by any beam language. Mm-hmm. So there's some really, really great things happening uh, that would allow for incredible uh, distributed mm-hmm. lisping um, by anybody. Yeah. Who Are you able to uh, hear uh, Robert? I could not yeah. hear him. Oh. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get that figured out anyways. Uh, anyways, um, but, uh, yeah, stick, stick on the line, Robert, because, uh, we'll have it, we'll, we'll refresh, or if you want, you can refresh your browser, maybe the connection will work. That's worked for me. Um, yeah. Cause it seems to be that we're having all sorts of, I did answer this. Uh, are you having right, trouble hearing? Like is- That's the thing. I can hear you fine. Um, I can hear you fine. It's just weird that, uh, it's like weird. Some of us, it's, it's some of the speakers can't hear other speakers for some reason. It, it does seem to be a one to one thing. It's like I couldn't hear Robert. Duncan couldn't hear Augie or Ogie or, or however it was pronounced. I'm not sure what's it, what exactly is happening. Yeah, that's it's correct. Kind of <laughs> unstable. Uh, but, anyways, uh, hopefully it all goes to YouTube. <laughs> and then we go watch it after. <laughs> we watch and hear what everybody was saying. Yeah. This platform obviously isn't um, written. Yes, yeah, so there was a question earlier. I answered it in text, but I, I'll, I should go ahead and say it here too. Um, so the question was, do I need a physical MIDI device to run the example, or can you just do it all in software? Yeah, for the MIDI stuff, all you need is MIDI. It can be hardware. It can be software. I use most of my stuff as VST. I do have uh, a Korg that I play, um, uh, and I, I do control it sometimes. Uh, and I have, like I said, this, this Moog, uh, Moog clone that I use on my desktop sometimes. But really, almost all of my stuff uses uh, MIDI uh, software. Um, so yeah, the examples that uh, the code that are going to be published in the repo, uh, the, you can follow along with uh, with Andrew and his talk. Um, that can so if you do it like Andrew does it, then you can use the internal uh, digital signal processing audio uh, support that Extempore has. My example code has ported that so that you can use it in MIDI and anything MIDI. So if you've got uh, so for VST plugins, just in case you don't know, you do need a host. DAWs, digital audio workstations like what we talked about, you know, um, Ableton Live, et cetera. Um, these provide hosting, VST plugin hosting capability, and you can connect to it as if it was a physical device. Um, the Ardor uh, open source uh, DAW does that as well. You can also get standalone um, applications that act as a host for VST plugins, and depending on what you get, um, um, it may come with a, it may come with its own host. You may have to get another host. Uh, some of them are free, some of them aren't. It's it's a hit or miss, and it's kind of a, a big wild jungle. But um, as long as you've got a VST plugin host, you can play software synthesizers. And there are some great open source software. Oh, if you like modular synthesis, there is a phenomenal set of, of, of synthesis, synthesizers uh, you can use for free, uh, Eurorack style, virtualized. That's VCV. Uh, VCV, yep. Uh, give them a check out. Um, and there's a really great open source synth that I forget. Uh, another one that's completely free and it comes standalone. And it's not modular. You can just play it like a regular, regular synthesizer. I should have known that by the top of my head by now. But you can find it. Searches you'll find. So there's something out there for everyone and you can do it too. So um, anyone else? Floor is open. Oh, I had that question before. Um, music being highly concurrent. Can you, uh, can you hear me? Evidently, he cannot hear you. Cannot hear me. Let me, let me, let me try refreshing. Let's see. That's weird. I can hear you. Yeah, this, yeah so can I. This, <laughs> this platform obviously isn't written in Erlang. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's registering a poor connection for you, so maybe we restart. Yeah. Hey, at least the errors appear to be localized. <laughs> One second. We're going to try something here. 
um, for the speaker. Um, let's see if I can find this. Um, it looks like he's connected with a better connection now. So hopefully, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm gonna. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, you can hear you. Yeah. Hello? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah we can hear you. But maybe he can't hmm. hear No, I can't hear anything. <laughs> I hear you. Oh, I heard somebody. <laughs> yeah, maybe me. Um, we can't be off in our own universe here. <laughs> uh, we, we need to... See, Duncan, you're the one with the plaid shirt, right? That's right, yes. Yeah, uh, I can't. Are you? I can't hear you. Oh, no. Well, it's being silly to ask a question and not be able to hear the answer. Hmm. Just, just try refreshing uh, again. I'll try to refresh again. Anyways, uh, let me move on to another question. Uh, I'll try to get back. Um, one second here. Um, he's going to just rejoin, but because uh, we have some audio hacks, which I think is also causing problems. Um, so he's going to just try with the regular thing hopefully we'll get the uh, sound system working better um yeah we had to do so well we we're planning on doing the live okay, demo I am uh, here. yeah can, can you hear can can everyone else hear him can you yeah, who me? yeah i think uh duncan i can hear whoever's asking if we can hear, can you. hear you yeah i can hear duncan <laughs> okay um so i guess continue on i think we're good mm. what was that question <laughs> okay so uh, yes i hear you oh i hear you let me ask quick okay so <laughs> Oh yeah. Um, so music being like an uh, inherently a concurrent system, it seems like there's a natural mapping from, say, musical instruments to Erlang process. So I was just wondering what you thought of that approach. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and in fact, when I first started exploring undertone, a uh, possibility of, of creating undertone, that was one of the models, the mental models I was operating under. What would that look like? You know, how, how would that... Um, uh, how would that behave? In reality, what it comes down to is you really like what does um, what's managing the instrument that you're playing. And more often than not, it's like a, a VST plugin host for me. If I'm doing software, uh, software instruments, sampled instruments, MIDI instruments that are on software um, and uh, and signals through extempore just to hardware. Um, if I'm using a hardware MIDI. So um, the mapping in reality is not quite as good as the natural mental model feels. Um, that being said, the process for doing that is uh, managed by an Erlang process um, that can be, so you could think of it as sort of an abstract instrument that could play any one of these instruments that it sends signals to, so yeah. Well, I, I mean, I understand, of course, you've got all this stuff that you want to use that's outside of the Erlang system, but imagine mm -hmm. that you were just interested, say, in the compositional aspects of the music, and you just, all you wanted to do was have your pure Erlang program send out MIDI events. Uh, right. Yeah. So, uh, so to, to do MIDI, you need, um, you need to connect to a, a device, uh, like on your system, that is uh, the actual... Uh, the, the, the associated device, whether it's virtual or a physical uh, device. And then you also need access to any of the 16 channels for that particular uh, MIDI out. Um, and an instrument can be uh, on any of those 16 channels. So, uh, so when you're showing, but I, I, I want to focus not on the how you actually get uh, the music out, but the compositional aspect. So when, like when you're talking about that Markov chain stuff, was that... I, I couldn't remember which lisp that was written. Was that in extempores? Yep, yep, that was extempore, yep. Okay, so so man, you just had one of those, I forget what you call the Erlang primitives. You know, forget about like the robustness. Just imagine you got the magic primitive that could, boom, send a note out, whatever, even if it's standard out. Uh, but using that model of the Erlang processes compositionally, like you did with the markup chains. 
So if you're going to look at it compositionally, then all you're talking about is notes and there's no concept of device or outputs or anything. And that doesn't need a process. You can do any straight up data structure that can capture timing, tempo. Um, yeah. Um, combinations of notes. Yeah. All the whole, whole nine yards. So you, you can do that just straight up uh, list data structures. So, yep. There's nothing running. It's static. It's a composition. It's a piece. It's it's, and it's only when you need to transform that piece into something that can then interpret it and play it that you need to think about functions or long running processes or whatnot. Okay. Yep. I noticed. I uh, a, oh. yeah. Go ahead. I noticed that uh, there were abstractions in the code uh, for different scale types, like Aeolian was mentioned somewhere. Can you hear me now? Um, Connection lost. Oh. This That's is why I stopped hearing him. Um, I hear him. Let's see if he comes back. Anyways. Can you hear me now? I can hear whoever's asking, but it, I don't know who else can. I can hear. Yeah, I can hear as well. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Duncan, uh, if you click the link that I sent on a lot of audio troubles for a talk on audio, I heard somebody say I can hear as well, but I couldn't hear the other person. Okay. <laughs> it might be a slight delay or something. Who, who was asking? So there's a question, question there uh, from William Fisher. Um, you know, blues music or slide guitar. Uh, yeah, all my blues music is straight up on my, on my Gretsch uh, guitar. That's that's where I put it. Uh, and all all the, the sliding that I do in it, that's there. I have not tried to do anything like that in, um, um, uh, in in MIDI. Really, is is what my primary um, mode is for for music digitally. And um, there's no reason that I couldn't. Um, and in fact. You know, actually, so I take it back. There is, so I have several ramping functions that I've implemented in LFE that send MIDI control signals to like, and I, made, I made reference to that where I said in the demo, here I'm physically changing this knob, go see another demo for how to do this via LFE. So the MIDI CC codes, or sorry, MIDI CC, I think C, one of those C's is code change, no, maybe just change control. Anyway, there's MIDI CC you can send that's not note values, but rather uh, chain, change other values, control codes you can send. And you can use these on, you have to know which uh, the, the uh, given instrument, they will all have different codes and you have to know which ones map to which knobs and which functionality. Um, but you can you can change uh, all sorts of things uh, via this uh, mechanism using these control codes. For slide, you would use that same function that, so the, the ramping, ramping up, uh, so for, taking like the cutoff uh, or the frequency, like yeah, in the demo is where sort of a muted do, 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 do sound, that's sound, taking the frequency up. So you ramp that up. You can also apply sinusoidal or any sort of function to those. So instead of applying to that to a MIDI code, a control code, apply it to the actual notes themselves and give it a range. And you're gonna have it ramp up in a, a so you can simulate a slide, MIDI of course being zero to 128, um, in value, so you're, there's, there's going to be uh, quanta. It's not going to be smooth and continuous, um, but to the human ear, it's going to be close enough. And so you could simulate a slide using these ramping functions and and MIDI notes instead of uh, control. But I haven't actually applied that to MIDI notes. I've only applied them to um, to the control notes. So you could do some fun blue stuff there. Okay, um, anyone else? Uh, I, I have one more question. Like in your processes, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so in your processes, like when you're doing the LFE, can you compensate for the latency that MIDI introduces, especially if you're playing from VST plugins, like each, each plugin will have some, some latency. Mm -hmm. So in situation when you're trying to play live with somebody else, it would be very important to compensate for latency in all these uh, plugins. Absolutely. So um, yeah, there's a lot of tricky problems to solve there. Uh, 
if you wanted to dive deeply into it and solve them at a very high resolution. So if you wanted to be able to play 64, uh, no, it's, I think it'd have to be even higher. Yeah, if you were doing incredibly fast um, um, timings in your notes, more than 64th notes, uh, you, you would run into these issues. Um, yeah. So in, let me back up a little bit. I actually ran into some weird timing issues with extempore uh, when I first started doing uh, MIDI and, you know, because there's all these little different things happening and the latencies were odd and I wasn't getting appropriate matching. Well, it turns out if you decrease the frame rate of extempore and instead of, instead of having it fire, I think by default, it, um, um, uh, 100, 1,024 uh, uh, um, ticks in a second. I think that's the default frame rate. Um, and yeah. if you bring that down to 64, uh, all of those issues disappear. And all of my time, like the sequencer, the sequencer sounded garbage. It was just distressing to me until I dug through the mail list and had some chats with uh, with Ben Swift and, uh, and Andrew Sorensen on the mail list. And confirmed, yes, in fact, if you bring your frame rate and extempore way down, uh, sequencers and LFE sound great. They sound like the classic sequencers. Timing is perfect. Um, so what I noticed is that even playing rapid, rapid fire, high tempo, uh, um, uh, you know, 64. Actually, I, I, to be honest, I haven't I haven't done anything with 64th notes, but I have done 30 second note uh, pieces with LFE and undertone. Zero issues in latency across hardware, playing hardware simultaneously with um, uh, with software and uh, MIDI devices and whatnot. Part of this, I can say, is due to the fact that Extempore is doing a really nice job of essentially um, quantizing its its frame rate and making sure that everything plays at that particular time. Um, the other part is that uh, the DAW that I'm using does a really good job. It has excellent buffer control. Um, and depending on the settings, uh, you can you can really get a nice synchronization going on between other devices. I don't have an external MIDI time clock or anything like that, but you can introduce these things as well. These are solved problems that people have used on stage for, for decades, since the 80s yeah. when, when MIDI came out. So yeah, there are all sorts of things uh, that take care of these problems for me, and I haven't had to address any of those in code. Long story okay. to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's perfect. Thanks. Yeah. I'm going to close the stream soon. We'll continue after the stream is closed. So stick around for more conversation. Have you experienced markup chain driven transition to different harmonies and subsidiary generation of melodic fragments using chord factors? Um, so I've only done a little bit of, of experimentation. There is this whole swath of things I want to dive into. Um, uh, so there is one demo that I did that used Markov chains for um, volume levels, chord transitions. There were five separate things happening, and I've lost track of it now. I have to go back and look at the source code. Um, I have not done any crazy dynamics of like feedback mechanisms, and I haven't done anything with um, layering of you know, like borrowed chords or or even parallel chord. I haven't done anything like really extraordinary in music, or not even extraordinary, but like the sort of classic things you do for like great jazz performances, uh, people playing off each other and, and, you know, with the various modes. I haven't done anything with that. So there's a, a whole swath of things that could be covered um, that I haven't tackled yet. But yes, you're absolutely right. There's it's. Uh, fertile ground for all sorts of amazing experimentation. Basically all the stuff that you would do, you know, in live improvisation or even composition, you have at your fingertips to explore using new tools and new approaches uh, with this. So, but yeah. yeah. Bye Robert. See you. He's such a great guy. Um, okay. Bye bye. And thank you. It was great. I'll be seeing you and hearing you. Yeah. Bye all. Bye all. In the bye. meantime, I think it's a good opportunity to, uh, to close the stream, um, I want I want to thank I want to thank you, Duncan, for uh, this excellent talk. I think uh, really got I think oh, a lot. Of people I can't hear you anymore, Arthur. I, that's okay. Just uh, <laughs> let me finish this, and then I'll close the stream. Um, he's just saying that he's closing the stream. So, he, oh yeah, I, I want um, I want to apologize to our YouTube audience for all the craziness, but uh, I still hope you'll 
even in spite of that, that you'll still like the He's video. He's probably saying stick around for the after conversation. Like the video, uh, subscri subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Um, and most importantly, share this uh, to uh, your, your, you know, maybe your other uh, programming meetups or, uh, or uh, socials or whatever. Um, with that, um, closing the parentheses. Um, Wait, before you close the parentheses, this is recorded on YouTube if I want to show a friend. Yeah. Yes, it's all on YouTube. I'll, yeah. I'll send Post you a link to the chat. Yep. Yes, it's all Thank on YouTube. You. So tell them to uh, also like the video too after they see it. So uh, with that, now we're officially closing the parentheses, and uh, we'll see you next time.